Italy and France have experienced a spike in COVID-19 deaths. Here in Australia, the numbers appear to be stabilising. The news of COVID-19 is everywhere. Victorian health authorities say... You can hardly get away from it. ...passengers who've been infected with the virus. But the great majority of people are not aware that 100 years ago there was an epidemic just like this one. The influenza pandemic of 1918-19 was the worst disease experience the world has ever known. It was unique. As an historian, I find myself amazed at the resemblances. The 1918 Spanish flu pandemic was very bad and very severe. The current estimate is that this virus killed about 50 million people worldwide, and that's just mind-boggling to imagine. At the moment, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic is very bad, but it's certainly nowhere near the 50 million that 1918 was. There are no survivors now, or hardly any, I think. But there's oral history that's been collected by historians. I went to Sydney University in 1919, and the university closed. The death rate was very high. You'd be talking to somebody today, and in a couple of days, they'd be dead. Mum caught the flu, and uh, she was only sick a couple of days, and she was taken to the temporary hospital where she died. She left three of us. I had two brothers. I was a year and 11 months. It was usual for most people to take Lifebuoy soap and to sniff its bubbles into one's nose, thereby defying germs of the Spanish flu to take up residence. The pneumonic influenza has often been called the forgotten pandemic. But it lived on, certainly in the memories of the medical profession, who never forgot the lessons. It's the old adage, those who don't know the past are condemned to repeat it. If we don't look back, if we don't learn each time we have these viral outbreaks, then we are condemned to make the same mistakes over and over again. At the start of 1918, the world was entering the last year of the First World War. Reports started coming through that there was a new, different form of respiratory disease that was spreading quite rapidly through the troops. It was becoming painfully clear that Australia was in the line of fire for pneumonic influenza attack. A great threat was looming. World War I had started in the late summer of 1914, and people had been at it for years, enduring the war and losing lives to the war. Men had been fighting in the trenches and living in squalid conditions. They'd come down with so many diseases, so of course just one other respiratory disease didn't seem that different. But this one was different. It was much more contagious. In fact, we had several thousand Australian troops dying overseas of pneumonic influenza before it ever reached Australia. At the moment, we don't really fully understand where this virus emerged. We're not sure this could be a direct infection with some sort of animal flu virus or some sort of new flu virus. At the moment, what we think is probable is that the virus emerged in military camps in Kansas in the US for World War I, and then those troops deployed to Europe. They spread out through the battlefields, they spread out across the globe because it was a world war. And probably what played a big role in the spreading of this virus was actually the train networks, which let infected individuals travel over a large distance. World War I really affected how the pandemic was reported, because you can imagine that countries that were engaged in conflict, they didn't want to tell the enemy, actually, 50% of our troops are sick with the flu, because that would make them look weak. The King of Spain, Alfonso, came down with this new, very infectious disease. And Spain, unlike many other countries in Europe, wasn't at war during the First World War, so they didn't have censorship on their newspapers. Spain 
did not have those restrictions on freedom of press and reported the virus. Now, unfortunately, that meant that it was dubbed the Spanish flu, even though we are most certain that this virus did not originate in Spain. As the disease moved into its second phase, the death rate took off alarmingly. People's lungs were being filled with a kind of bloody froth uh, as their lung tissue uh, broke down. And uh, a very bad sign was the complexion of the sick person taking on a kind of mauvish purple hue. Some patients developed this thing called cyanosis, which essentially meant their lips turned blue. And this was particularly in individuals who were in those sort of middle ages of life, from about 30 to 45 years. What you saw is that it was this overzealous immune response. So as soon as you get fluid in your lungs, then it's obviously very hard to take in oxygen and your body shuts down in the absence of oxygen. It's actually quite an analogous process to what happens in some of the severe cases of SARS-CoV-2 infections or, or COVID-19 infections. And it's actually remarkable that more than 100 years later, we're seeing a very similar progression of disease, even though they're caused by different viruses. Australians could be accused of feeling threatened on all fronts by pneumonic influenza because it was coming down the bottom of Africa and it was coming from the United States and Canada across the Pacific Islands and reached New Zealand before it came to us. So in effect, Australia was sort of ringed all round by potential sources of pneumonic influenza by October 1918. Australia's best defence, as it had been through most of the 19th century, was maritime quarantine. You didn't have the risk of air travel. And if you could block ships coming to Australia, you could essentially block the transmission of this virus. So that's what Australia did. Australia was ringed by quarantine stations at all of the major ports, including Sydney at North Head, Melbourne at Point Nepean, and also Western Australia in Fremantle. From the 1830s, Sydney's North Head Quarantine Station had been a really important first defence in helping keep out all sorts of infectious diseases. We're very fortunate today that the quarantine station is actually very similar to the layout it had 100 years ago. This is the shower block area for the third class arrivals. And it feels pretty cold and industrial because it was a processing centre. This is where new arrivals would come off the ship They'd take off their clothes, scrub themselves with carbolic acid soap as a disinfectant and move into the quarantine station. There was an inhalation chamber where you were meant to breathe in this really irritating solution of zinc sulphate. There's accommodation blocks. There's also a hospital. John Howard Lidget comes to my grandfather, was the chief quarantine officer for the Commonwealth. He um, spoke to the various ministers saying that this was a disease which was not going to be able to be contained and that the only thing they could do was try and prevent its entry into Australia. Cumston was alarmed about the possibility, but he was also confident in the organisation that he'd built up. He was a doctor, he'd been trained in public health. There was enormous pressure to make sure that he was protecting the country from this disease. Cumston had received a number of warnings from overseas. There were two telegrams, one from South Africa and one from the Director General of Health in New Zealand, both of which painted a pretty bleak picture. The Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa considers it advisable to draw your special attention to the extreme seriousness of the malady. The the Director General of Health in New Zealand said that um, epidemic spreads just as quickly as people from place to place by tram or train or motor. Mortality is appalling. Treatment by vaccine utterly futile once this epidemic is started. It's my understanding that my grandfather had a lot of political pressure applied to him and um, my Aunt Margaret has stated that the acting Prime Minister of the time, William Watt, 
had told my grandfather that if he was unable to contain the epidemic, then he would be hung from the nearest tree. The first cases of pneumonic influenza started reaching Australian quarantine stations in October 1918. The medic was a troop ship that had been sent to take a group of Australian reinforcements off to fight in Europe. It was growing across the Pacific when the message came through, the war's over, the armistice has been signed, you can all come home, we don't need to fight. When the medic turned back, they had to stop somewhere to refuel, and they chose Wellington. Harry Hansel, my grandfather, and the troops on board were not allowed leave, but the officers and uh, nurses were allowed to have shore leave. And then at that point, they've come back on the ship uh, carrying, the, carrying the, uh, the Spanish flu. We have two first-hand accounts of soldiers who were aboard as it sailed into Sydney Harbour, flying the yellow flag of quarantine from its mast. Harry Hansel and Alec Dill. It was such a grip on the crew. The crew were down, and a lot of the men were down, and I had it myself. By the time he gets back to Sydney, the uh, Spanish flu had spread right through the ship, and Harry and the rest of the soldiers on board were interned at the uh, quarantine station. As far as I'm aware, he was there for six months. There were just over 800 people on board the medic when it came into Sydney Harbour. The ship, I think, embodied the true fear of the pandemic and what might happen if the disease broke quarantine and got into the city. I was taken off from the stretcher mm -hmm. and landed on this big room, a very big room on the concrete floor. There were 20 nurses from Sydney who volunteered and uh, one of them saved my life. She said, what's the matter? What's the matter with you? She said, yeah, you got the doctor and she said, we'll give you an injection, it'll make you jump. It made me jump all right, it was <laughs> okay with me. And uh, I found afterwards it's fiction. It's pretty alarming for us today to hear that one of the treatments given to Alec Dill was an injection of strychnine. Now, that was known to be a notorious poison that could easily kill you, but it was also known to be a stimulant. And from what I can tell from the records, it certainly perked him up. If you deteriorated, they had another ward they called the acute ward. No, I don't think anybody ever come back out of that. Among the army nurses who volunteered to uh, look after the men from the medic was Annie Egan. Annie was a young, passionate nurse from Gunnedah in New South Wales. She was from a good Catholic family of nine children. Annie joined the Australian Army Nursing Service and then she received a telegram basically ordering her to the quarantine station. According to the nurses, it was mayhem. Overcrowded, people everywhere, bodies everywhere. Face coverings was pretty much the only defence that they had. And they sometimes used them and they sometimes didn't. Annie caught the flu very badly, very quickly. About two days after getting there, she was an invalid herself. As she sank uh, towards death, she was begging to be allowed to uh, make her last confession to a priest. The priest came to the gate and they wouldn't allow him in. It was a huge media story. The family weren't told that she was sick. They read about it in the newspaper and they couldn't believe it. There was a significant standoff on one side with the military guard and on the other side, Catholic clergy and a large number of citizens all rallying in support of Annie Egan. So this is the local Gunnedah newspaper. It's very fragile. This is dated December the 5th. So at this point, they're still waiting for answers as to why she couldn't receive a priest. She did end up dying without receiving that last sacrament, which the family were pretty upset about at the time. She was buried with full military honours in the grounds of North Head. And although it was too late for her, 
there was a subsequent reversal of policy so that priests, along with doctors and nursing staff, could be allowed into the quarantine station as long as there were controls on them being let out into the community again afterwards. The maritime quarantine that Cumston had installed was going well, but no one, least of all Cumston, was convinced that it would hold out indefinitely. And so preparations had to be made for the flu coming into the community. We're outside the Victorian Parliament House, which at the time of the flu pandemic was the home of the federal government. So it was here that in November 1918, the health authorities and also Dr. Howard Cumston met together to nut out an agreement on how to deal with the, the flu pandemic if it arrived. That meeting was instrumental in deciding that the Commonwealth should take a leading role in managing the quarantine. It was understood that if two states were infected, they would not cut themselves off from each other. At the beginning of 1919, although hundreds of cases of Spanish flu had been treated at quarantine stations, we'd managed to keep the disease out of the wider community. And that had an important benefit because the later the influenza reached your community, the milder the version of the disease. Much like today, Australia was one of the few nations in the Southern Hemisphere that had managed to contain the disease. Cumston was able to say to the press that it looks as if we've, we've got this licked. There were headlines of the sort that says, flu threat defeated. Almost as soon as Cumston had made his pronouncement, a patient was being treated in Melbourne Hospital. While the treating physician, Dr McMeekin, believed he was seeing a genuine case of pneumonic influenza, other doctors believed that it wasn't pneumonic influenza, but rather was the seasonal flu. So while doctors were arguing in Victoria, a soldier boarded a train in Melbourne bound for Sydney. And he found himself in the same compartment with a person who was very, very sick and then two days later got himself admitted to Randwick Military Hospital. And by then it was too late. When he was diagnosed, it had already spread out into the community. So the Premier of New South Wales said, well, this is the flu, this is, we've got it. And he notified the Commonwealth authorities on the 27th of January. Almost immediately, a war of words broke out between New South Wales and Victoria. New South Wales felt that Victoria had let down the side by not notifying its infection as soon as it could have. New South Wales closed its border with Victoria, even though it wasn't meant to. The other states started closing their own borders against each other. Queensland closed its border against New South Wales and South Australia against Victoria. When the states shut their borders, it happened bang, straight away. And so in places like Albury, Wodonga, or in Tenterfield or Wollongarra, you can see people flaunting these regulations on the borders. They're passing messages or food to each other. And they're also having quite angry meetings about what to do with this problem of hundreds of people stuck in their town. Ultimately, the Commonwealth realised they'd lost control and backed away from the agreement themselves. And they said, you manage what goes on within your communities, we'll just keep up the maritime quarantine around the country. The pneumonic flu affected people across Australia, but Sydney was particularly hard hit. In fact, it's believed to have been the worst affected city in Australia. The way of life was really changed for Sydney siders in that period. The New South Wales government and the other states started to enact measures to prevent the spread of the disease. They started shutting down places of amusement and places of gathering. 
So they sh shut the schools, they shut the cinemas, they shut public halls, places of worship, what we now call social distancing. So everyone who was working in the cinemas and in shops that closed, they all lost their jobs. A lot of wharf labourers were laid off. So there was a big spike in unemployment as well. In the first few weeks of February, there was growing anxiety amongst the public. They knew that this epidemic was going to hit. And when news came that a vaccine was being developed, everyone just was clamouring to get hold of it. It was administered in the basement here in Lower Town Hall, and people would have queued up uh, possibly for hours to uh, get their vaccination. In Sydney, there were over 2,000 depots for vaccinations finally established, and this was replicated across Australia. My grandfather, he set up the Commonwealth Serum Laboratories to develop vaccines, which produced three million doses of vaccine, which were used to help defray the uh, impact of the Spanish flu. The quarantine station up at North Head was integral to this. They had to actually get some sputum from one of the patients, so the actual infected pieces of, the, of it, and, and create this vaccination. There were businesses, large businesses, that also um, inoculated their staff. We have an interview in our collection with Joyce Higgins. She was a young girl growing up in Woolloomooloo. We had a cousin that worked at Grace Brothers and they'd gone to give an injection to all the workers and the doctor must have used the same needle 10 times. My cousin, to the day she died, had a mark up here the size of a florin because the needles were so thick. I mean, everything was so crude. Yeah, but they had no choice because it hit so suddenly. A lot of people were really desperate and, and quite rightly so. But of course, we know now that this pandemic was caused by influenza virus and not by a particular bacterial pathogen. So it's really unfortunate that they were essentially starting from the wrong point. Perhaps the vaccine had some benefit in reducing the risk of secondary bacterial infections, but in terms of having an effect on the virus, it's very, very unlikely to have had a substantive effect. Companies and also the council installed these inhalation chambers. You can see some photos where people were face down into a machine. They were exposed to a vapour of zinc sulphate, a little bit like sucking up Vicks vapour rub fumes. Uh, it was meant to help cleanse their airways. Unfortunately, it probably had the opposite effect and likely made them more susceptible to influenza rather than less. The state government also declared that the 3rd of February was mask day. And so everyone who was going to be out and about was meant to be wearing their masks. One day the police fined 50 people for not wearing their mask. All of them were smokers and they'd all just sort of pulled it down so that they could have a cigarette. I remember those masks very well, sort of butter muslin. My sister used to make them. I was at Fort Street High School then, and we had our masks on, most of us. And one of the teachers, I think it was Fanny Cohen, she got so annoyed, she said, for goodness sake, take off those masks. <laughs> it would have been awful trying to teach children mathematics <laughs> with these masks on the face. But we did look strange. One of the difficulties in monitoring this compulsory wearing of masks was that actually the medical advice um, kept changing. And so there really was a level of frustration amongst the community. The severe regulations under mounting public pressure were gradually relaxed. But unfortunately, that led to a dramatic increase in the number of cases from March and into April. And sadly, the second peak, the one that came during our winter, was actually worse. There were more people with severe disease, more people going to hospital, and nearly twice as many deaths as had been seen in April. <laughs>
And you often see at the time people referring to an explosive spread once the flu got into an unprotected community. We kept getting telegrams from Kuma and there was a telegram, send help at once, Charlie died. We were horrified. Charlie was my brother-in-law. My great aunt, my mother's aunt, Kathleen Woodgate, left her family in Parramatta in Sydney. Kathleen was only 21 at that time. It was midwinter. She travelled down to Cooma, arriving into this cold and bleak place. When I arrived at Cooma, they took me round to my sister's place, and the yellow flag was flying. <laughs> The four children, they were very ill, vomiting blood and coming out of their nostrils. It was nasty. My mother was one of those children and she was age five. She suffered lifelong respiratory problems. This must have been an extraordinarily traumatic time. My sister was taken to hospital with a miscarriage, all the upset and everything. I said, it's all right, I'll do my best. And, of course, I didn't know what to do. There is, like, a massive shortage of hospital beds. Governments were trying to find any available space to build these places where people could be cared for. The Palais Royal at the showground on the corner there, there, that became a hospital, and they were dying left and right. You know, some of them would tell me they'd just take it in there and they he wouldn't be put to bed, they just went, oh, well, he won't last long. And people were going, they were fast, they could dig graves and make coffins. The exhibition building in Melbourne was meant to be a convalescent hospital for flu cases, but it was full of real cases that were, some of them, very serious indeed. It was thought that it would be better for patients to be nursed in their own homes as far as possible. Teams of cyclists and motorcycle teams of doctor and nurse go to homes that were stricken. People would put up a sign in their window. One would be a card saying SOS. Uh, another would be a yellow card or a piece of yellow cloth like a flag. It was indication to the, uh, the local authorities that somebody was in need of help. I think everyone in Willamaloo had the flu and there was no cure. So all you done, you went to bed and you stayed there for four or five days. They were dying like flies. They had trams run up Rock Street with a great big red cross on them. In Sydney, a special tram operated to take patients from the city out to the Infectious Diseases Hospital, known then as the Coast Hospital. This is the cemetery just down the road from the Coast Hospital where many of Sydney's pneumonic influenza victims are buried. And there's over 300 of them lying here, mostly in unmarked graves. The number of burials here gives us some sense of the scale of the pandemic, with over 4,000 deaths in Sydney alone and up to 15,000 right around Australia. And it certainly made it into Australia's Indigenous communities. The death toll was markedly higher amongst those groups it also spread to many country towns, and some of them had quite a significant death toll. Wonthaggi, I believe, was one of the last places in Victoria to be hit with the flu. It's um, over 100 miles from Melbourne. We're in the town hall where my mother came to help during the Spanish flu. She was only 19 years old then. Oh, I volunteered to help at the town hall and there were five of us that volunteered. None of us had had any training. There was a big square tent to be put up for the nurses to sleep in. Then there were carpenters making the frame for the stretchers and they were very busy. Eventually we had 41 men in the town hall. She was locked in here for three months. <laughs> Wasn't allowed out, really. <laughs> 
And they kept bringing them in. There was a man with a horse and a kind of gypsy van going around to get the patients. So as soon as we had five stretches, he went out and brought five patients in and they kept on making them. One man particularly didn't seem too bad to me, had no complaints, but uh, each day his temperature went up and no matter what we tried, it didn't come down and he eventually died. People were dying all over the town and, and I know that my auntie uh, adopted a little child because the mother had died, so it was a, a really very sad, stressful time for everybody. In Australia, we stopped officially measuring pneumonic influenza cases in August 1919, and certainly by the end of that year, the pandemic had finished on our shores. But it left, I think, a lingering impact. What happened at the end of the pandemic is not that this virus went away, it did not disappear from the human population, but it became much more like our seasonal winter flu strains that we see. It's really interesting to reflect on an event that happened 100 years ago that's a bit similar now. I think it helps people understand that they're perhaps in some senses not alone historically, that there have been these things that have affected communities and people throughout time. There are no statues and, and very few memorials to people who died or people who were running great risks for the sake of their community. One thinks of heroes in relation to war and not in relation to illness, but there were heroes, doctors and nurses and volunteers and neighbours who went to each other's aid and who risked their lives for the well-being of others. In 1919, our community responded and they pushed through the crisis and they came out the other side of that. And that's what I'm seeing today as well. People are caring for each other and they're trying the best they can to approach this with a bit of good humour and with some fortitude because they know we'll come out the other side.